Now, I want to be very clear because the title of this panel, the 40 tabletop games, it sounds like one of those top 40 garbage list panels. Right. Yeah. Usually when you see clickbait on the internet with titles like this, you click on it and then the actual article is nothing. Right? We do the opposite. We use a clickbait title, which gets people to come, which I guess worked to some extent. It yeah. Didn't, didn't fill the room, but it's 1030. That's pretty good, right? Uh, but no, we're not going to give you garbage, right? We're giving you the opposite. It's better than what you think it's going to be. But I want to be very clear. These are not the best 40 games. No. This is not a top 40 games in tabletop. No, no, no. More importantly, these are not the most important 40 games. No, no, no. A game does not make this list just because it was the first of something. It does not make this list just because it is notable for some reason around the way it was created or how much money it made or who was involved in it. k is arguably the first worker placement game. One of them, if not the... The only one that might be it, if it's not this, is this game called Bus. Never heard of it. But k Oh, actually, I did hear of Bus. Yeah, you've heard yeah, of Bus. Okay. In the last time we did this panel, you specifically said, oh yeah, I've heard of Bus. I did. I, just... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a website, Spiel by Web, where you can play Bus by like email. <laughs> But Kalis is a board game, and it's fascinating, and it's very important to the history of board gaming, but it's not interesting enough to talk about in this panel. <laughs> These are not our favorite 40 games. I love Initial D. Initial D is garbage, right? So the <laughs> games that we're going to show you today right, are not going to be the games that we like. There might be games that we hate up here. There are, in fact, games in this panel that we do not like at all. Right, and there might be games that we really, really like, but we're just not going to talk about them because they have nothing to do with what we're doing on today. Yeah, don't go to panels where someone plays the Wu game and says, hey, I like Mario. Do you like Mario? Yeah, Woo! Mario's great. And now you think that I made Mario somehow. And now you're cheering for me when really you're cheering for Mario. This list is in a literal random order. I don't care who wins between Batman and Puerto Rico, the board game. We just made the slide. <laughs> we just go as we make slides, as we think of them. Like, oh, this game, next slide, this game, next slide, right? It's the order we thought of them when we put together the slides. Yep. We have definitely missed games. We didn't we, put too much effort into this. I already got... <laughs> we did I, the bare minimum to get the free badge. That was it. <laughs> And also, I do not need to tell you that chess exists. Maybe you do. We don't care if we missed anything. Yeah, you fanboy coming up the end. Oh, have you heard of this game? Yeah, I've probably heard of more games than you. I'm up here and you're down there. That's how this works. (laughs) Do not be the person you've seen at every panel who's sitting in the back of the room like this. Trying to talk about your favorite game. We're not taking any questions from anybody. Keep your hands down. (laughs) And if you've seen us give this talk before, which it sounds like most of these people haven't, we changed this panel a lot. Yeah, we did it south, we changed like two slides, whatever. I think <laughs> I changed four slides. Because I added a slide Big money. right here five minutes before we let them in. Is that photo from Pack South? That photo is from Pack South. Yeah, okay, great. Who went to Pack South? And more importantly, Not you, enough people. you could, you don't even need to be here. You could have figured this out on your own. The only way we figured this panel out is because we played a lot of board games. If you just went and played a lot of board games, you might make the same list. And if for some reason you think you have something better to do right now at PAX, which you probably do, that camera back there is going to send this straight to YouTube, most likely. It looks well, no, it really it's, sucks. It's going to send it to my hard drive, and then to Premiere, and then if all the pieces of audio and video line up, it might appear on YouTube. Might appear on YouTube, so you might not have to be here. Also, isn't the South one on YouTube already? We didn't do it at South, we did it at MAGFest. I don't remember. <laughs> but the real important thing here is that if you play a lot of games, a lot of different kinds of games, this is a set of 40 games that if you play them all, you'll have a pretty full understanding of the full scope of what tabletop games are and what they could be. Yeah, most of the time when I see a new game, I take a look at it and I go, ah, I see what's going on here. It's like this and this and this. I always, like, I rarely, rarely ever see a game that's really unique to me. And when I do, it's really amazing because I've played so many games, right? And the game, these are like the games that I you know, reference most often. Like, oh, you know, I see this, these themes and mechanics keep reappearing in new games. So if you play all of these, then as you go out into the world and play new games, right, this will give you that sort of background knowledge to say, ah, I've seen this before, I've seen this before, I've seen this before. So let's get right into it. The best game. I am going to cheat. The first game is our favorite game. Tigris. And also the best game. Tigris and Euphrates is an amazing Kinesia German style Euro board game. And what make it what makes it interesting is that most board games really only get between four and twelve plays before they're played out, because there's degenerate strategies. There's 
broken mechanics. There's balance issues. The game is so simple. There's only so much to explore. Yeah. And then you've seen it all. Tic-tac-toe should take you a couple plays at most to figure it out, and you don't need to play it again. It's rare for a game to have a lot of replayability among skilled, serious players who are trying to be good at it. Notice how certain cards in Netrunner, certain cards in Magic don't get used because people figured out that they're not worth using. This is one of the rare board games that has nearly infinite replayability. We've been playing this game consistently for a long time, and we've never gotten sick of it. 2002? We've, ne we've never exhausted our strategies around it. We're excited to play it every time. I could go to Tabletop and just play this all weekend. They're coming out with a version soon that's new. It's called uh, Yellow and Yangtze. That's hexes instead of squares. I don't know how it's going to be. That's going to change everything. I feel like you don't need to go that far because this is already enough. Right? But the other interesting thing this game does, part of the reason the game makes this list, if we can say two unique and interesting things about it, this has an interesting scoring mechanism. You gotta get green cubes, and blue cubes, and black cubes, and red cubes. Your score at the end of the game is, of all the cubes you got, what color do you have the least in? So if somehow you have 100 black, 100 green, 100 red, and one blue cube, your score is one. Congratulations. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Dune. Frank Herbert's Dune was adapted into a board game a long time ago, before most of the people in this room were born. Right. Now, this game is very hard to get and out of print from the 70s. I bought one on eBay that was in pretty good condition, luckily. But that's okay, because it's been reprinted in a form called Rex. So if you find a game called Rex, that's this game, only redone a little bit. And doesn't have the Dune theme, because that costs a lot of money. But a lot of nerds will actually take Dune and just take, buy another Avalon Hill game and just reskin it and print it out and make the Dune game. A lot of people just print this game out because it's a game from the 70s. You can just make it with a printer. You're good. So point one about this game, this is a better version of Diplomacy. So there is no reason to actually play Diplomacy. Just play this. You'll get a very similar experience, much more compacted, much more fun, much more interesting. Also, this game very, very closely matches the theme of the world Dune. There's a spice deck and a treachery deck. Right. If you like Dune, then this game is for you. And third, the best thing about this game is that there are six factions. If you know about Dune, you know what the six factions are. Emperor, Bene Gesserit, whatever, right? Every six faction has a ridiculous, ridiculous superpower. And like, you'll pick up the first one and read the superpower and be like, I want to be this one. Oh my god, this is so unfair, I'm gonna win. They're all so unfair, they're gonna win. <laughs> they're so unfair, I'll tell you what one of their powers is without even knowing any rules. So there's these things called treachery cards. They're a big deal. Most players, you can only have four in your hand at any given time. Harkonnen, get eight. And think of your favorite game and think of like the character or the class or the deck that's like so OP, right? Now imagine six different OP decks all fighting against each other at once. That's what this game is. When you buy treasury cards, you don't pay the bank, you pay one of the players. If you want to move guys onto the board, you pay a different player. You're paying the dude that you're about to attack to bring the troops down to attack them. <laughs> And this game, there's so many unique things about this game. It has joint victory. You can form binding alliances and win together. Only when the worm appears. And more importantly, the Bene Gesserit, one of the factions, their special victory condition, they write down before the start of the game the name of a player and a turn number. If that player wins on that turn, the Bene Gesserit win. <laughs> I, there is no game that is, we, is wedded theme and game mechanics so tightly as this. It is a unique and interesting experience. You can almost treat it like a role-playing game. Mm -hmm. Mafia. Werewolf. You know you see a bunch of kids at a PAX and they're sitting in a circle and they're making a lot of noise and you really want them to go away. Most people, most people play Secret Hitler these days. Yeah. Right? Secret Hitler's good. Or one of those. We're not saying don't play those games, but Werewolf is the purest and most original form of this game. It's interesting because, one... It is a game that you can play with a nearly unlimited number of people who may be strangers in a convention and you don't need anything but enough space to make a circle and annoy the people around you. <laughs> the other thing is that a lot of people play this game, right? It's been changed a lot over time because usually the rules spread by word of mouth. Not a lot of people buy rules to Mafia at the store, right? You learn from somebody. But the old real way to play that no one wants to play with me is a way that I think people should play. And that is normally when people play, right, you go to sleep at night, the mafia wake up and kill someone. Kill him. Yeah, okay, they die. 
No, no, no. The way it should be is that each individual mafia or werewolf wakes up at night and tells who to kill, and if they don't unanimously decide, then no one is killed at night. And this means that the mafia and werewolves need to communicate during the day when everyone is awake. I saw Scott looking at JoJo. He is definitely mafia. So if you're in the mafia, you're like trying to wink at the other mafias and like, be like, kill Ram. Right? <laughs> but meanwhile, someone, some you know, citizen sees you winking and looking and they're like, uh, I see Scott winking and nodding. He's probably, we should kill him right now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Now, we've had a lot of fun playing this game. We don't really play it anymore. It obviously has its very deep flaws as a game. But there is another interesting thing it does. The way the rules are written, or at least the way people should play it, it has rules of social interaction that inform the game. You can argue and be social and yell and scream forever, but as soon as you point, you take an action, you accuse someone of being a member of the mafia, there are rules about that. Everyone has to shut up. And now you go through the process of deciding whether or not to murder them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> simple social rules, simple constraints around the way players interact can have drastic consequences on how a game functions. Mm -hmm. Codenames. It's, Code names, for a reason. it's like the hottest game because it is super accessible. Like almost anyone can sit down and play this game. And it also has a very high skill cap. You can be very, very good at this game. And even if you think you're very good, it's possible for someone else to be better. Yeah. Right? It's also great, you know, you play with someone who you have a lot of connections with, right? If I play with Rim, I can say things that don't even make sense because it's some inside joke. And then he'll be like, oh, that card, that one, yeah, okay. Right? <laughs> and then switch it up and play with a complete stranger. And it's like, uh. <laughs> Has this person read Dune and how clever are they? <laughs> like, you know, it says treachery on one of the cards. And I'm like, Harkonnen, Harkonnen. And they're like, oh. <laughs> The other interesting thing about this game is that it can, it can actually, it's like a party game. It can have, an a, it can have any number of players effectively because you just form two teams. So when it says, in essence, it's a party game that's not Twister and not Trivia. It's pretty rare to find a good party game that isn't Twister or Trivia. And even if you got kids and they can't read, they got pictures now, they got Disney now, they got Marvel, they got good ones. Battletech. Yes. Woo! Now, what's interesting is you will be able to play this in video game form soon, following all these old grognard weird rules. Most of them, they change a little bit. Yeah, but Battletech is a game where you play it by having these mechs and doing sort of squad combat tactics, but it's one of those old school games where you're spending a lot of time rolling D6s over and over and over again, and then using lookup tables to figure out what happens. Right, there's these old crusty war games, you know, your squad leaders, your advanced squad leaders, right? <laughs> stuff like that, right? You know, those games are really hard for anyone to play who's not, you know, very old with a beard, right? <laughs> Battletech is like the bridge between the modern game and the old games, right? It's accessible, right? You know, but it's also obviously crazy complicated. Look at all this nonsense. <laughs> You're going to be looking up the book and like, wait, what happens if someone has but the in fibro the, whatever right, armor? But in the end, you take 10 damage to the right arm and you fill in 10 bubbles on the right arm. And it feels really good to fill in little bubbles, right? <laughs> Actually, it doesn't because those are your, you fill in the bubbles on your own arm. You want someone else to fill in the bubbles. <laughs> right? But, you know, also, big giant robots. Yeah. Right? Feels good. But this is where things get interesting. People who know us, like, we're really focused on competitive games, fair games, games that could be sports, games where if I win and Scott loses, I have proven that I'm smarter than Scott in this very narrow world. <laughs> this game is not fair. No. And it's very random. We have seen many Gauss rifle shots to the head in our day. <laughs> but that means it's more simulatory, it's more emergent, narratives evolve. You're playing a game and you're trying to win, but this game, because of all the randomness, ends up creating a narrative, and that narrative is represented in this artifact, the sheet, as you cross things off. And if I have some old Battletech sheets, and I remember exactly the moment that my day turned terrible. <laughs> And since it's so simulatory, even though it's a board game, right, and even though the rules aren't that big, there's still rules for everything. It's like, can I jump on his head? Yes. Can I pick up a tree and whack him with it? Yes. My what if arm I'm... just fell off. Can I pick it up and hit someone with it? Yes. <laughs> Instead of a mech, can I buy 7,000 Jeeps? Yeah. Yes. I would like to just have one airplane. Sure. Scott really it's likes the airplane rules. Scott likes a lot of small lasers. It doesn't really work out. Uh, you can stand in. Oh, my neck is overheating. Can I stand in the lake to cool off? Well, yes, you can. The lake <laughs> is now steam. <laughs> so, have any of you played original Dungeons and Dragons? Like BECMI Dungeons and Dragons. The, you know, the, you know, people have the red hoodie and it has the picture of the dragon. It says Dungeons and Dragons. That one. 
I have one person. Wow, interesting. Okay. So if you want to experience what a real original Dungeons & Dragons was like, rather than playing original Dungeons & Dragons, which has its problems, play this game called Torchbearer. Right. This is a modern, redesigned, st streamlined version of essentially old Dungeons & Dragons. If you play a newer Dungeons & Dragons, you know, pretty much second ed up, right? The thing you get XP for is killing dudes, right? So usually most D&D, 3rd ed, 4th ed, 5th ed, Pathfinder, all these sorts of RPGs, they all focus around fighting and combat, right? Okay, we're gonna move our miniatures and I'm gonna cast my fireball spell and you're gonna cast a lightning bolt and hit a guy with a sword and you're all figuring out your deep, maximum DPS, hoping to roll a 20, all that sort of nonsense, right? And all the, like even modern MMOs just borrow from that and they're about combat. People don't know that that old D&D, fighting dudes did not get you a lot of XP. It was not a good idea, and you would die easily. Very easily, right? The way you got XP in old D&D, gold. Give me the gold. You would go in the dungeon, and all you wanted to do was get gold and get out. It was one XP per gold, and you can get a treasure chest with, like, thousands of gold in it. Oh, yeah. Right? So Torchbearer is a modern RPG that's not crusty, old, and out of print and hard to find, but it's the same thing. It's very easy to die. You manage your inventory the same way you do with like XCOM, right? Where you have inventory little... Tetris. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, you can't carry too much stuff, so you find that tapestry that's worth a lot of gold and therefore worth a lot of XP. So you Good leave luck your... carrying your tapestry out of the dungeon. You leave your armor castle. behind to carry the tapestry, <laughs> and then skeletons attack, and you drop the tapestry, and rats eat it. And now you have no armor and no tapestry. Play this game? Yeah. Zendo Zen got re-released recently, but Zendo was interesting in that in the old days, Zendo was a game you could play with these physical pieces called, uh, well, Looney Labs made them. They're Ice House. They're, there's a game called Ice House, and it uses these Ice pyramids. Dice. Well, ice, it's, they're Ice House pieces, they're ice pyramid house, yeah. pieces, whatever. But there's like a zillion games you can play with these pyramids of various shapes and colors, right? I think there's three sizes and a whole bunch of colors. And the cheapest way to get lots and lots of these pyramids was to buy a game called Ice Dice and just get lots of copies of it together, and then instead of playing stupid Ice Dice, you played Zendo instead. <laughs> Luckily, Zendo got re-released, and you can just buy Zendo now. Now, Zendo is different and has different pieces and a different theme, but the gist is the same. This is a game where one player is the master and all the other players are the students. I'm the master. You're the, the student. Uh, the master makes a sort of structure here, like a set of these pyramids, and another structure of these pyramids. One of them has the Buddha nature... One of them does not have the Buddha nature. And the students take turns making their own constructions of pyramids and asking the master if they have it or not. It's kind of like mastermind. You're trying to figure out what the rule is that the master has in their head that they're following. Yeah, the master has decided, aha, any cone that contains a red pyramid will be good and the ones without red are bad. And then start making, you have to figure out that that's what the rule is, right? That red is good and no red is bad or whatever, just by looking at examples. And then you make examples, you force the master to make examples for you. You get the master to tell you which examples are good and which ones are wrong. Sometimes the students guess which ones are right and which ones are wrong. And then the first student to actually figure out what the rule is, is the winner. This game is interesting because it has a scale of infinite complexity. You could make a rule like it has the Buddha nature if it has exactly one red pyramid. You can also make a rule like it contains the Buddha nature if the number of pips on the pyramid times two is, I don't know, greater than 100. Or if the number of pips on the pyramids is prime. If there are three red pyramids, X or four blue pyramids, parentheses, and there is a yellow one on its side pointing at a black one. Right. But the most fun thing is to come up with a simple rule that drives people insane because they can't tell what to do. That's what I like. The other notable thing about this game is that if you bring it to a convention, set it up on a table and start playing it, it creates a spectacle. People walk Especially over. Especially if you get one that has a lot of examples going. And they really want to know what you're and doing. people can hop in and out, right? You can become a new student. You can give up as a student and quit school because you're not smart enough. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, here, if you're playing some, like, four-hour Twilight Imperium and a player has to go to the bathroom or has to go to a panel, like, your game's over. People can quit this game constantly. It does not affect the game at all. You can even bring in a new master as long as the old master is like... <laughs> so if a stranger comes up and says, hey, what are you playing? You can say, sit down. Let's play. You don't got to sit. You can just stand. Fast food franchise. Oh my god. So, Why did you put this in here? 
Chops and Chicken Surprise. This is an indie board game from before we had the term indie board game. Is it from the 90s or something? It's from the 90s. Yeah, good luck finding this. The 90s, ancient times. <laughs> Two, that is an abstracted map of the United States of America. <laughs> it's shockingly accurate. It, it kind of is, once you play and understand it. But anyway, this game is just freaking garbage monopoly, right? There is nothing to this game except... except it ends. It ends real quick. <laughs> this is like... If you want to play Monopoly in like under an hour, boom, done. This is a fascinating example of Monopoly is a terrible game. Literally, all you do, you roll the dice, you move around the edge of the board, you land on stuff, you buy a fast food franchise. But sometimes you feel that you kind of want to play Monopoly. Like, you feel this urge to play a game that has the... You know, you talk about food, there's mouthfeel. With games, I like to say that they have a brain feel. The brain feel of Monopoly, like there's a, there's a reason, sometimes you want to eat some garbage. This is that garbage distilled into its purest form. This is so appropriately named, Monopoly. So appropriately named. <laughs> this game is worth playing. You will enjoy it, and just at the moment when you think, oh man, this is getting boring, it's over. <laughs> Spotted. Oh, we got a friend. His name is Chase. He's not at this PAX, but he's at most of the other PAXs. Actually, and he hasn't gone to PAX in a long time. He switched to Joko Cruise. No, oh, yeah, yeah. He, but at PAXs... Not that Joko Cruise is bad. I want to go. His superpower is that he would take this game and wander around the con. And by the end of the con, he would have a thousand new friends. I mean, he made a thousand new friends with or without Spot. But Spot is his magic weapon. Spot is the simplest game. It's a little baby game. He's got these little discs, and they have symbols on them, like a cute spider and ice cream cone. You can get a themed Spot if you want. They have hipster Spot. I have Halloween Spot. It's got like bats and stuff. There's NHL Spot. That's a good one. That is a real good one. Yeah. But the deal with the game is that it's got a bunch of little game modes, but basically you've got all these little discs, and every disc has exactly one symbol that matches every other disc. See, if you pick any two discs at random, there will be exactly one symbol that appears on both discs, no matter which two discs you pick. So the game comes down to, basically, standing around with a bunch of strangers, holding these things in your hands, and trying to find the match. Bat. Ah, oh, crap. Ice cream cone. Uh... Ice cream cone! I'm out. And then one person's left holding all the discs. Watching people play this game is fascinating because it can take almost an unlimited number of players. It takes two seconds to teach someone how to play this game. You can just hand them all out in a panel room. One time we handed one to every person in a panel room and made them all play at a PAX. And what happened was, after a few minutes, it all coalesced. We and this one... This. When did we do this? We did this at PAX East 2011. I don't remember this. There's it's video of it. Up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Eventually it collapsed into this one really flustered dude just standing there holding this pile of cards going, what happened? <laughs> if you, since it's getting a little warmer, hopefully soon, right, they make Spotted Splash, which is made of plastic. It comes in a net for your beach enjoyment. It's a simple game that looks like it's for kids, and it'll make you feel really stupid when you play it, because it's way harder than you think it's going to be. <laughs> Jungle Speed jungle is a... Jungle Speed is not Jungle Slow. It is a tabletop sport. Mm -hmm. And I say that... You're, it's basically that game where you flip over cards and eventually something matches and then two people have to grab a wooden totem. So this game tests two different skills. The first skill it tests is your you know, visual recognition of patterns, right? It's like, so there'll be two cards. There's basically a bunch of crazy shapes, as you can see, right? And some of the shapes are really similar. Obviously, on purpose, very, very similar, right? And there's no two cards that are the same shape and the same color. This is like a, it's a completely unique deck. But whenever two cards of the same shape appear, right, then there's a duel between two people, and now we test your other skill, which is manual dexterity. Grab that wooden log as quickly as possible, right? So good things to do. Number one, put that log in another room. <laughs> Bad things to do, accidentally knock it over the balcony at MAGFest. <laughs> Good things to do, drink heavily before playing. <laughs> Bad things to do, break someone's finger playing it. <laughs> I want to point out, I did a Google search for this panel for jungle speed injury, because it happens, like, we know someone who broke their finger playing Right, the game. current, so if you go to the, the tabletop library, there's a bunch of jungle speeds in there, but they all have the rubber totem, which is the Made for America totem. They're bringing back the wooden one. Just wait a few months before you buy jungle speed, and you'll bring back the wood. But this is very important. I did my Google search for in jungle speed injuries, and that's what came up. But that's Jason Morningstar, the designer of Fiasco. <laughs> 
Another good thing to do is like, you know, you mess with people while you're playing the game. You're like, it's a match, it's a match, right? If someone puts their hand too close to the totem, just smack their hand right into it, and now they fouled because they weren't supposed to touch it. <laughs> the important thing about this game is that there are tabletop sports. The, the line between sport and game can be heavily blurred. Puerto Rico is the game. In terms of Euro-style machine-building, like, action-taking games... No luck games. This might be the perfect one. Right, see, nowadays, that number one spot on Board Game Geek just keeps on changing over to, like, the latest hotness. What's up there now? Gloomhaven? Yeah. yeah. That doesn't look very good to me. I mean, Twilight Struggle was up there for a while. Yeah, that piece of garbage, right? <laughs> but before those games started rotating on that BGG number one slot, Puerto Rico had that spot for years. Unopposed. No one even, it was like unthinkable to rate something higher than Puerto Rico. With good reason, this is the best game. So Except for TNA. The notable thing, number one, about it is that it is so tightly designed, so well designed, so balanced. When you lose this game, it is the fault of the series of decisions you made, and there is no randomness to blame. You made the only your randomness is what turn order is at the very beginning of the game, but they balance that out by giving you different numbers of corn and indigo or whatever, and which you know plantations get turned up uh, randomly, but that affects everyone equally, so it's not a big deal. It illustrates another point. It illustrates the tightness of game design in that three player, four player, and five player in this game are all equally good games that are completely different. Yeah, we mastered th three player, but then we went and we added another person, and we're like. Mm. I don't know if you know. Hanabi was probably the first real co-op game I've seen get popular. Yeah, most of the co-op games out there that people really love, you know, have fun with them, like Pandemic and etc., Shadows Over Camelot or Battlestar, or all these games, right? They're actually solitaire games, most of them, right? It's like, imagine me and Rim and a whole bunch of other people sitting around Klondike Solitaire, Microsoft Solitaire, and working on it together, like, uh, move, the, move the 8 over to the 9. No, move the 8 there, that's obviously better. Oh, okay. Now do that. Now do that. Now do that. You I'm playing solitaire. You don't need help to figure out Pandemic, right? One smart gamer can figure out everything. You don't need help from other people. Hanabi is a game that is actually co-op, right? You are playing with the other people. It's the weakest link in the chain. You know, if you have three excellent people who are great at Hanabi and one person who's not, you can't help them out, right? Because you can't see your own hand of cards. You play with your hand facing out, and you play blindly. Yo, the only things you can do are play cards blindly or spend a resource. There is an information economy in this game. None of that, like Shadows Over Camelot, you can't talk about what's in your hand, but you can hint at what's in your hand. No, no, you can't say nothing. I'm, I'm sure I can handle that challenge. I'm too sure I can handle that challenge. Yeah, no. So in Hanabi, when you want to tell someone something about their hand, you have to flip over one of these limited number of discs and say, you, these are, you have two twos, and now they know that these two cards in their hand are twos, and these other cards in their hand are not twos. Right? Now, the now they got to remember this, and it's up to them to remember because you can't tell them again without spending another disc. Now the act of communicating with another player is an action in the game with rules and consequences. Information economies are shockingly rare in games. This is a beautiful implementation of that concept. A better, another one that we didn't want to talk about because it would take too much time is another Kinesia game, same guy who designed Tigris and Euphrates, called Res Publica. Mm -hmm. Vinci, how many of you played Small World? You know Small World? Yeah, okay, Small World was actually a remake and redesign of this game, Vinci. And the reason they redesigned this game is because, well, look at it, it's kind of ugly. <laughs> Small World's way more fun with skeletons and stuff. Also, this game had a lot of typos and stuff in it, and, like, the rule book was a little messed up, right? It needed a fixing, and they gave it a good fixing, but they also changed some very important rules that I think make the game less fun. The two major changes from Small World are, number one, in Vinci, the game would end when someone hit 75 points. You don't know how many turns this is going to be, right? In Small World, the game ends after X turns. I forget how many it is because I don't play Small World. The second thing is in Small World, you get the two stacks, right? So it'll be like skeleton wizards or something like that, right? And you can only get one of each. In Vinci, it's just a big bag of little squares. You can get barbarians, barbarians, right? You can get times two. Well, there's only one times two thing in there, right? But you can get like navigation, two, there, navigation. There are two times two things. Are there? You can get times two, times, times two. Times two, times two. Yeah, okay. What, the, what this game really illustrates is that Small World is a more refined, more polished version of Vinci that cleaned up a lot of mechanics and made the game simpler and more straightforward and more balanced. Adding all that balance and cleaning kind of ruined the game. This game is just as skill-based, but it was messier and had a lot more emergent gameplay. Very unbalanced combinations could appear, 
But because of the way the rules are written, this game, the players had to deal with that and work around it. So this game is still highly skill-based, but it's a much more engaging and varied experience. Small World is a very constrained experience, and it's a, there is, in the end, Small World is a limited number of plays before you find perfect strategies and there's no reason to play it again. So the moral of this is that just because you made your game better doesn't mean you made it better. <laughs> so there is a whole class of games that most people at PAX do not play. Traditional card games. I'm talking trick-taking games like Euchre, Hearts, Pinochle, Spades. These are games that people generally do not think of as in the same world as these games. I mean, those are all the games that I started playing from the earliest days, right? My grandpa was like, hey, here's how you shuffle cards. Yep. My dad taught me how to hustle people for money in hearts. <laughs> let's play some backgammon. Let's go. Right? Trick-taking games are having a resurgence. There's a lot of indie games being designed now and being released that are actually trick-taking games. But most modern gamers have never played trick-taking games. So Wizard, Fantasy Wizard in particular... With this deck of cards. You can play with just normal decks of cards, but this one is way more fun. Well, because this art is both amazing and terrible at the same time. <laughs> I mean, you can already get a feel based on the four Wizard cards. I imagine you put the Nars on the next slide, or do oh, you put Scott Johnson so on the next slide? The game is in German, so it's a Z because they're Zauberers and not Wizards, because it's in German. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The deal with this game is a trick-taking game. If you don't know what a trick-taking game is, play Wizard and you'll find out what a trick-taking game is. Right. The best thing is unlike, say, Bridge or anything, you don't have to worry about you know, the, like, these weird bidding systems and things. This is accessible to anyone. You can teach this to someone as their first trick-taking game. But also, even someone who's very good at trick-taking games can go deep on this one, right? This isn't one that like, you give up on. It's just a baby version, right? It's like, it's a real deal. Oh, you didn't put Scott Johnson or Nars on the next slide. Uh, no, I didn't. There, we have a friend, Scott Johnson. If you ever see him, he looks exactly like one of these cards. <laughs> it is terrifying. Bonanza, you know all these games where you trade stuff? Yeah, like in Settlers. It's like, I'll give you one wood for two sheep. Hey, 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 right? Everyone loves trading stuff. You ever play Genoa? Genoa is a game where all you do is trade stuff. It's great. And people love to trade things, but a lot of times in playing games, trading is not a good idea. You don't want to trade one wood for two sheep. You're just giving the other guy a road and you're watch, getting two sheep. Watch a pro play Settlers of Catan. Watch like the qualifiers and the championships. People are not trading. They're trading if they're ripping someone off. That's about, And you're not ripping someone off as good at the game, right? Bonanza is a game in which every turn is going to be two cards in front of you. And you can either plant those cards in your bean fields or trade them. And a lot of times, you don't want to plant them in your bean fields. You better trade them, right? It's a game that forces you to trade, right? You'll get more trading action, which brings all the fun of trading, right? But without any of the, oh my god, if I trade, I'm going to lose. Because you still have to give someone else points. But then when it comes to their turn, well, they're going to have to give you points. And the other interesting thing this, this game does, and it's so unique that when I see it in other games, we actually call it Bonanza Hand. And it seems weird. I was very dubious of this game when this was explained to me. You have a hand of cards, right? You can only play cards out of the front of your hand. The cards closest to your human body. You can only add cards to the back of your hand, and you can't ever rearrange your hands. Yeah, if you rearrange your hand, well, game over. <laughs> Don't do that. If you're like me, you're like shuffling cards in your hand with a bonanza, you gotta be like, mm. I've only seen one other game ever that does that, and it's a Japanese indie game called Wind the Film. Oh, yeah, that's right. Glory to Rome. Mm. This is the game to teach you if you like Carl Chuddick games. <laughs> if you like this game, you'll like Carl Chuddick games. If you don't like this game, just pretend you never heard that name. All right, so he's a guy who made Innovation, and he made Motainai, and they're all pretty similar, but this one is the best one. The only, the interesting thing about this game, like the reason I'm bringing it up, because we don't have time to like explain the rules of all these games. This game has hard and fast game ending conditions. This is the opposite of Power Grid, where you're having a good time, and then the thing happens that triggers the third phase. You're like, oh crap, what do we do? Let's remove three of these, and move this, and every player gets two more turns, and then we do final scoring, and then final final scoring, and then we look at the bonus scoring. This game has rules like, if someone builds this building, the game ends immediately. That's my favorite thing to do. There's a catacombs. You just go build, 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 GG. I mean, if someone builds the last site... It's worth like, three points. You can build it so fast. No one yeah. has any points yet. The game ends immediately. Mid-turn. The second the card hits the table, the game is over. Fuck you. It just ends. 
The and other thing about this game is that it has all these crazy unique cards, right? The sewer, the walls, right? And you look at some of these cards, and when you put them together, you say, wait a minute. If I do this card and also this card together, isn't that a crazy OP combo? And in the rule book, there's actually explanations for every crazy possible combination of cards. And 100% of the time, when you say, does this really do that when you work them together? It says, yes, yes it does. <laughs> there are so few games where logically reading the rules and following the like what cards imply to their fullest extent is always allowed. This is the first game I've ever seen where it is always the correct answer. It is so tightly designed. Camel up. You ever play Street Fighter and there's that level where, you know, Balrog's level, right? The boxer, right? And everyone's standing off to the side with money in their hands like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right? They're trying to bet on this boxing fight, right? If you want to role play being that guy, only betting on a camel race. <laughs> <laughs> this is the game for you. This game is mostly random. And it's still super fun, even to us jerks who like these super competitive games. You're just betting on this camel race. The other interesting thing, so see how the camels are stacked up there? So let's say that that stack moves across the finish line. Green wins. Let's say this stack moves, and then the yellow one moves, and then the green one moves. The last place camel might suddenly be in first place. All right. There's one die, right? It's like a D3 for each camel. And they go into the pyramid, and you shake the pyramid and push a button, and a die comes out. So you don't know which camel is going to move in what order. And each camel only moves, you know, one to three spaces. But the order in which the camels move, right? Oh, the white one could move two, and then the red one could move three. And that white one that looks like it's in the last place could be all the way in the front, right? Right, based on the order those dice come out of that pyramid. The amount of and you're tension, trying to bet on this. tension and drama that comes out of this game with camels is amazing. <laughs> and if you want to, if you, if you don't get enough of the camel up, camel cup, there's a super camel up cup. Add more, add more track. So Tales of the Arabian Nights. I'm gonna, Full disclosure, I do not like this game. I don't like it either. I never want to play it again. <laughs> Everyone in this room should play it at least once because it is amazingly built. This is a board game. I think it's more of a book. <laughs> I mean, not the, not the old book. That gets... <laughs> <laughs> it tells a story. You'll land on a space and look through a book and read a section that's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure. Ah, you encounter a genie. The genie says this and this and this and this and this and this. Do you do this or do you do this? It's, it's like... It's like a mullet, sort of like a choose your own adventure book, but everyone's moving around this map, choosing their own different adventures all the time, constantly. It's not a role playing game, it's a storytelling game. What narratives emerge while you play? You're ostensibly trying to win, but what winning means is even sort of complicated. Right, even though each of these little pieces of the story is like pre written in the book, just hard coded, right? When you combine them and string them together in different ways, right, the story of your character is now different. Right? The context of that meeting with the genie could be very different if you had just, say, been running away from, I don't know, someone trying to chase you for stealing, or if the king had just sent you on a mission. Right? The and the answer you give the genie might be different based on that as well. The fact that this game works and is so complex and is implemented entirely with pieces of cardboard and paper is and breathtaking. one giant book that someone spent way too much time writing. Breathtaking to behold. <laughs> and the other fact... Good job. Eric Goldberg. Yeah. But the other real fascinating thing about it is that it abstracts those decisions. It's not like you say, I hit the guy or like I run away. It asks you questions like, do you respond to this old woman with piety or violence? It's very abstracted. It gives you a lot of room to imagine what the story actually is. Eclipse is the most complex 4X game you can possibly implement in a tabletop setting and have it still be playable in a reasonable amount of time. Right, there's plenty of them that are playable in a tabletop setting in an unreasonable amount of time. <laughs> People always try to play them. How many Twilight Imperiums? There's four Twilight Imperiums in, over there in packs, and every pack someone plays one and finishes it like at the last second. That's, okay, if you want to spend your... I don't know how much does a pack's ticket cost. I don't <laughs> if you want to spend your whole day of packs playing one game, go ahead. But if you play Eclipse, you can spend half your day of packs playing one game instead. <laughs> but the reason Eclipse is noteworthy is that all that complexity, there are physical things the game does. Like the simple way of how cubes are arranged and how you represent resources are extremely elegant 
and they are designed to allow a lot of complexity to happen with a small number of pieces relative to that complexity. Right, you think about a game like Master of Orion on the computer, right, the digital version of this, or this is, I guess, the cardboard version of that. But either way, it's like, it's so complicated because you have a computer, you can have an infinite number of numbers until your memory runs out, right? You can open up menus upon menus of menus with all these numbers and stats of everything and whatever, but you can't do that when you got cardboard, right? So here, they managed to narrow everything down, just like a few rows of cubes and some chits and some plastic pieces, but it's still exactly the same game, right? All those numbers are really unnecessary. They abstract everything away to the maximum possible without losing the kind of game it was or oversimplifying to the point where it becomes a baby game. Amun Ray is a bidding game. Bidding games are pretty common. Well, bidding, you're, you're bidding, meaning you're sacrificing to the well, Egyptian gods. Well, you bid, you bid on what provinces to get. Then you bid by deciding how much money to sacrifice to the gods, which might involve actually stealing from the temple instead. Bidding is a component of a lot of games, and a lot of gamers are shockingly bad at dealing with bidding. You need to play a deep, serious bidding game and start to understand what valuation is and what bidding is and what that means. This is a fantastic game to do that. It's also fascinating because it's almost an early form of a legacy game. You play the entire game, you score, then the flood comes and washes away all the workers, but the pyramids you built remain. Mm -hmm. Then you play the whole game again. Only the pyramids are still there. So now, you know, Abydos might have been an okay territory in the first round. But Scott built eight pyramids on it last year. Right. So now after the Nile floods and kills all of the farmers in Abydos and there's still pyramids left. Oh, I'm bidding 20 on Abydos. Look at all those pyramids. Oh, yeah. So it illustrates this very fundamental concept that by allowing players to bid on things in games, you can almost ignore balance because the balance comes from the players understanding the value of those components. It's like the quickest, cheapest way to balance a game that is otherwise unbalanced is have some form uh, of bidding mechanic. Right, you think when you're trying to balance a game, it's usually like, okay, I have this property in this game. How much should it cost? Ten? Oh, no one's buying it. Nine? Oh, no, it's OP, right? Here you just say, okay, we're going to auction up this thing. <laughs> I don't have to balance it now. <laughs> How much are you going to pay for it? Great. Elfest consists of these pieces, and that is literally it. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of flicking dexterity games these days. There's uh, catacombs, which is really great. Right? Like catacombs, you're like a wizard, and if you take the magic missiles, you go pew, 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 and try to hit the skeletons with them. Right? And if you play uh, flick them up, you're cowboys, and you flick bullets at the other cowboys, try to knock their hats it's off. It's a good time. Right? Elkfest is a little different. You're a moose. Which I guess is called an elk in Germany. Do not know. get into why it's called elk fest. I it's don't a even moose. Wanna... Anyway, the moose starts on one rock. Your goal is to get your moose to the other rock that the other moose started on. And you have these six shared stones that you can stand on. And you flick those stones, and then you move your moose and try to stand on the stones and eventually get to the other side. It's you, a game can... you can just stick in your pocket. Rust out literally anywhere. Play it on the floor. You can, you can play it on this table. You can play it across the whole room. You can play you it can... along that entire hallway over there. You can play it on an ice hockey rink from one end to the other. You can play it anywhere. This game is a study in minimalist game design. This is an escape room, like the ones people pay money to go into and like escape from a room, except it's a board game that you buy in a box and destroy. You play it once. It's a disposable board game. Yeah, I saw these for sale here down in the tabletop dealers, a few of them. There's like a few of them. There's not just the Pharaoh's one. There's like a whole series. And you buy one, you get some friends together, you open it up, you gotta tear and fold papers. I think I tried to spit on something once. You know, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. I thought your spit would work. I was really sad that that, that didn't work. Uh, yeah, they didn't go through like the full effort with like, you know, UV things and stuff, right? I thought it was gonna be a Star Tropic situation, but it ended up not being. Uh, I mean, it could have been. The notable thing is that this, these games, the series of games, they fully encapsulate the experience of an escape room, like the kinds of puzzles that are in escape rooms. It's pretty much just team puzzles. One hundred percent accurately. It's the exact same experience, just without the costumes and the actual physical room. So if you just like the puzzle solving, there you go. Good two-player games are actually pretty rare. There's more of them these days. Lost Cities, however, is a very excellent two-player game. Might be the best two-player game? Maybe it, Patchwork? It illustrates, for one thing, it illustrates this sort of symmetric scenario where you are taking risks. How much will you risk? And the other player is also making risks. But in the context of that, you're playing cards. Every card you play gives the other player information to better manage their risks. So this is a game, there's just like this weird anti-design pattern. You don't want to play a card and you don't want to go first. 
Games where you never want to take an action are often more interesting than games where you're really excited about your next action. Right. Because it forces tension. So... <laughs> That's too easy. If you sense how old I am, I started playing Magic when Unlimited came out. I started I... playing Magic. I looked, they recently released, because Magic Anniversary, they released a timeline of Magic. I realized, wow, I started playing Magic in like 93 and ended in like 95. I quit when Fallen Empires came out because I thought that expansion was BS. I think and I was my done. first pack was a fall. No, I think my first pack was a revised starter, but nah. I got Fallen Empires after that. Magic the Gathering is notable for two reasons. This is why you should play it if you've never played it. One, it still exists to this day. That's pretty amazing. Almost completely recognizable. If I sat down and played Magic today, knowing only the rules I knew in 1994, I could play the game. It would work. It is basically the same game. Mechanics have been added, but the fundamental core of the game is recognizable to me from that distant age of the, the 90s, that ancient past, to today. And two, there is a reason why it is the one. It takes up so many tables at every con. There's a reason it's so popular. You need to understand the context of this game to understand gaming as a whole. Fury of Dracula is hide and seek. Right, there's a game called Scotland Yard, which is just hide and seek. Scotland Yard is pretty good. Fury of Dracula is even better hide and seek. Dracula plays down these cards of where he's going to go face down. And the four other, it's four versus one, which is already awesome, right? Uh, the one person playing Dracula puts these cards face down, and that is the path that Dracula has taken. So they take, like, the London card and put it face down. And they take the Ireland card, and they put it face down. They take the Sweden card and put it face down. And there's a line. And the other people are exploring Europe, and if they bump into one of the places that Dracula has been recently, the card flips up. Aha! Dracula was in Sweden two turns ago. I know. But the fact that it implements hide-and-seek without someone drawing out a piece of paper by using this complex and elegant card mechanism is interesting in and of itself. The problem with this, any game where players are taking actions that no other player can observe are rife with cheating or rife with mistakes. Oh, yes, I was in London this turn, and I was in Moscow the next turn. <laughs> yeah, no one would know. Even if you make a mistake, maybe you're not trying to cheat, though you might be trying to cheat. Yeah, I played the Manchester card. Oops, it was the Moscow card. This game, and Puerto Rico does this too, but this game is really notable for it. It has rules. There's a whole section in the book called What If Dracula Cheats? <laughs> if Dracula is There's caught rules. cheating, he loses like half his blood and, lose, and the sun comes out. It really sucks. But right? the, the but fact the, that the game keeps going. There is an error catch mechanism in this game. If cheating occurs, if the game gets broken, rather than just the game being ruined, as most games are ruined by someone breaking a rule, in this game... It's not actually cheating. You can totally cheat on purpose if you're Dracula. And if you get away rule. with it, the consequences won't happen. There is a rule about it. Who's going to call you out on it? The four other players who can't look at your face down cards? <laughs> we got to move quicker because you keep explaining all the rules to every game. That's all right. Uh, so if you don't want to set your money on fire, you should play Netrunner, which is a much better <laughs> game than Magic. All right, so imagine if you went to the store to buy a pack of magic cards, and instead of there being random cards inside, you got three copies of every single card. And that's it. Every single person who plays Netrunner seriously just buys all the cards. It's like a subscription, sort of, right? The packs come out every once in a while. They're 15 bucks. And oh, look, every card is in there. So it's not, you play against someone who has this evil deck, and when you play against someone in Magic who has an evil deck, it's like, oh, you beat me with your evil, powerful cards that cost $500. No. You play against someone in Netrunner who beats you with an evil deck. I have those cards. Boom, now everyone plays the same evil deck. It's great. <laughs> The other notable thing about this game is you play two different kinds of things. You play First you play a hacker busting into the corporation, and then you play as the corporation trying to fend against the hacker. You go to your Netrunner tournament, you bring two decks with you. Some of the cards are red on back, some are blue. There's two different games, you know, the running, you know, hacking and the, the corporation defending. You know, you can attack someone's hand, reach into their hand, grab cards in their hand, look for points, right? And if you see points, you take them. It's great. So, Dungeons and Dragons is almost the opposite of Magic the Gathering in that it is still this like legendary thing that's been around forever, but its modern form is unrecognizable even from a few generations back. The theme is consistent. Shouldn't we the, put this next to the Torchbury song? The narrative around the game is consistent, but the game itself is so fundamentally different. Every let's look at this not from a like 
loot perspective or a game mechanics perspective, but from a role-playing perspective, to understand the context of all modern indie RPGs, all modern role-playing games, Acquisitions Incorporated, all these things, you should play a few different generations, a few different editions of Dungeons & Dragons and try to un identify what kinds of role-playing happen in those different versions. For example, Second Ed D&D has very loose rules. And what happened is game masters would make a lot of stuff up and drive a lot of narrative. Later D&D started really hyper-focusing these rules, and the game sort of turned into a WoW raid. And you'll just see this evolution. Studying the evolution of Dungeons & Dragons is a fascinating thing that will teach you a lot about gaming. Race of the Galaxy is notable because... It has a very complex set of iconography. Right. If you have played Race of the Galaxy, you look at this and you understand what all this means, and if you haven't, you're like, what are all these weird symbols? But once you understand these weird symbols, not only will you know how to play Race of the Galaxy, you'll be able to play it in like five minutes on your phone. You'll also know how to play Roll for the Galaxy in every other For the Galaxy game, right? Because they all use the same exact symbols and they all mean the same exact thing, right? A number and a hexagon is victory points. This game right? showcases the upper limit of the complexity of a language you you can expect your players to learn as a barrier to entry to even play your game in the first place. More complex than this, it's not worth anyone's time. And it's so good that none of you probably noticed that these cards are in French. <laughs> also, the game is very similar to Puerto Rico, which was like the best game we talked about already. Lady Blackbird is an RPG you can go right now Download for free, print the PDF, and play this game. You can run it as a game master it costs zero dollars. knowing nothing about it. It starts with the same characters in the same scenario every time. Its primary mechanic is, hey, remember that time we did that thing? And then you play out a flashback, and then that gives you a power now. So you start with a character with a sheet and some basic nouns and information on it, and as you role play, you both write the story forward and you write the backstories at the same time. And it's different every time. It's not like you can, oh, we've got the same characters. You can replay this thing. It's great. Pendante, poker kind of sucks. Because if you play poker to win, you're going to fold most of the time. Very rarely do dramatic things happen. You'll play a hundred hands of poker, and one of them is that maverick situation. So there's two ways to make poker great. Number one, add pandas. <laughs> and two, replace the flush with the floosh. Floosh. Pendante is a Euro design look at what poker should be. Imagine if poker was designed by someone who designs games today. It's poker where every hand is that crazy hand at the end of the tournament in the movie. Every single hand is someone bluffing like crazy, someone who's got equivalently a royal flush, people are bidding it up, it is insane. The other really fascinating thing about this game is that it's poker, right? The back of the book, the rule book, there's a section that says, hey, we don't advise this, but if you want to play this game for real money, here are the real money rules. Don't use those. <laughs> America is a trivia game that isn't bad. <laughs> and it's, because if you play Trivial Pursuit, you get a question like, oh, who starred in this movie? If you haven't seen the movie, if you don't know the names of actors... Everyone just goes, oh, and the that's same, it. The same person who made Power Grid had a hand in this game, Friedman Fries. Right, I saw someone uh, at Tabletop Library, they returned Marvel code names yesterday because they didn't know anything about Marvel superheroes, so they couldn't play, right? Anyone can play this even if they know nothing about America or American history. Because basically you're, bi you're placing cubes on guesses or near guesses, and so if someone else bids, like, guesses like this thing happened in 1950. You might think that they're probably smarter than you or they know something. You might bid right next to them and you'll still get a point or two. So you're looking at this physical board and moving cubes around. The mechanics are elegant. It's a trivia game that isn't bad and it's worth playing for that alone. I love this game. It's really good. So there's this genre of game that is called train games. About Tick choo-choo trains. Ticket to Ride is not a train game. No. Train games involve corporations Crayon. and stocks. You're drawing train lines. They're usually an exploration of some very particular year in America. Usually these like games are for people who actually care about the history of trains. Like, if you put the wrong engine on the car, they're like, hey, that car, that train didn't exist in 1846. It wasn't invented until 1848. The two reasons to play these games are, one, if you've never played the train game, this is a huge area of gaming that you know nothing about. <laughs> and you should at least experience it. I'm not saying so that you way, like you it. You know what people mean when they say train game, right? I don't know. I've played this game four times. I still don't know if I like it, but I want to play it again. 
So the point is, there's a whole series, the main series of train games is called the 18XX series, which is a lot of them, but 1846 is the gateway one. That's the first one you should play, and maybe the only one you should play. But the other interesting thing, you play a person with money, you invest in corporations and get stock in those corporations, you run the corporations and their money separately from your own money. But the winner is who has most of their own money. Dominion was the first modern deck builder. It's the best deck builder. It's the most elegant deck builder. There's so many things going for this game. All the other games that try to be a pure deck builder have largely failed or largely had fundamental design problems. Right. There's some other games that incorporate deck building, right? You get a clank in there or something like that. But even though after all these deck builders try to copy Dominion, Dominion is still the champ. Dominion will teach you what makes a, a deck building mechanic work, what doesn't, what's balanced, what's interesting, and what isn't. It does not matter which one. <laughs> this image is I typed some grognard ass board game into Google Images, and that was there, and I stuck it in the slide. Find one of those like musty looking games that looks like it's from the 70s. It has a bunch of cardboard shits with numbers on it. It's called like the Battle of the Marne or something. Just play one of them once, because you think the train games are this weird world? <laughs> Holy crap! Don't, don't play these at a convention where a person with a beard might be seeing you. <laughs> Do it at home with your friends, so that but, you don't get them coming up to you saying, Oh my god... These games are not, <laughs> not games you're trying to win. If we talk about simulatory experiences, these games simulate war to the point that Random crap happens because war sucks and war is random. This, these are games about managing that randomness. If you want to see what it would be really like to be a commander on a ship in the Battle of Midway, this is their kind of game. I don't know if you'll like them. I do not like them nope. particularly. But it's you gotta know time. about them. Risk is a terrible game. <laughs> Shogun, renamed to Samurai Swords, now renamed to Ikusa, is Risk but good. <laughs> or at least as good as Risk can be. The two fun parts of this game... We don't have time to go into detail anymore. You're going way too long. Why can't I go too long? Because we got like... I want to talk about hiring the ninja to kill nope. you. Nope. So, <laughs> this game, you bid for turn order. You might want to go first. You might want to go last. And also, the combat, like when armies fight, is actually complicated and engaging. And it uses D12s. That's true. It's the only game with D12s. El Grande we just played this the other day. is a fascinating Euro game that you should play. The main rule is, wherever the king is, can't touch him. Can't go there. If you like wooden cubes, this is like the first best wooden cube game. It also incorporates Gops, the game of pure strategy, as the mechanism for choosing who goes first and who goes second. Between two cities, the fundamental thing about this game, you're building a city with tiles on your left, and you're building one on your right. I'm collaborating with my player on my right and my player on my left. My score at the end is, of my two cities, which one had the lowest score? Think about that. Really think about it. But your friend is also sharing that city with you, and your opponent, I can't make your opponent is sharing this city. Too good. Pandemic Legacy, I do not like pandemic games. But Pandemic Legacy, if you're going to play one, you want to see what the deal is, this is almost more a role-playing game than a co-op game. It is a co-op game, but it's more a shared experience. It's something to enjoy. It's the best legacy game. It's the best of this genre. Deep Sea Adventure, you're a bunch of jerks in a submarine that's leaky, sharing the same air, trying to get treasure. Go to the bottom of the sea, grab a treasure, come back up, let your friends drown. <laughs> It illustrates shared resources. You're all drawing from the same pool. How deep are you going to go? Captain Sonar was How in the Omega Thon. around this thing? I told you, you kept going slow. Why you put so many? Uh, there's 40. <laughs> you knew how many there were. <laughs> Captain Sonar, you are two teams of four moving submarines in real time. The mechanic is one of your teammates is listening to the other side, trying to figure out where they are based on what they're saying and doing. Quartermaster General is Axis and Allies, but good. <laughs> Don't play Axis. If you want a game that has the same brain feel as Axis and Allies, but is actually an interesting game, this is the one to play. Notable about both Captain Sonar and Quartermaster General, they're team versus games. Quart uh, Captain Sonar is four on four. Quartermaster General is three on three. There's not a lot of board games that do this team versus team situation. Vast. Vast is fascinating because every player is playing a completely different game. 
I'm the dragon, Scott is literally the cave that we are in, <laughs> and our friend Matt is the goblins who are trying to steal something. I didn't, it's fun, but the real thing to see about this game is just the fact that it exists is amazing. And it has an expansion and added like an angry unicorn. <laughs> so we just played this game. This is a game where you can bid literally anything. So I might bid one, and Scott bids two billion. So you're trying to buy victory points, basically, when you're bidding, right? So whoever bids the most gets the victory points. At the end of the game, the most victory points wins, except whoever bid the most total money is automatically eliminated. And then we score among everyone else. So you can just bid a billion every time and win, but then you won't win. So we're out of time. So the last game, and this, Tycho tweeted about this at the beginning of PAX. Ooh, this is a game fantastic. called Inheritance. This is a LARP. <laughs> there are three kinds of LARPs. LARPs. Scary creepy, vampire kind. Creepy vampire people trying to make out with each other. Creepy vampire people again. People hitting each other with, with foam swords. That's also the creepy vampire people. And weird Scandinavian LARPs that are real. This... <laughs> This is an experience. You need to play it. You need to see what LARPs are like. This is the one to try. No foam swords involved. And we are out of time. I hope this oh, was enjoyable. It. If you want the list of games, grab one of these on the way out and check our website. There may be video of this panel on our website soon. If this sucks, why did you not leave earlier, but also take the flyer and report us for sucking? There is also a video, I'm cheating, of this same panel when we ran it with a different list of games at MAGFest not that long ago. It's already on our YouTube channel. I used to play Wrestling Rules Jungle Speed, where it doesn't matter who grabbed the totem, but if you have the totem last, you still win the duel. We played I that way, and that's why we... Got kicked out of a shopping mall once. That's how we got a finger broken. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I also broke my knuckle a few weeks ago. We came up with a very specific rule of how to determine who's got control. Yeah, if you've got it on the bottom, versus yeah, the fingers yeah, yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good game. <laughs> okay. When you say Scott Johnson, do you mean Frog Pants Scott Johnson or something uh, else? Different Scott Johnson. All right. There are, so like, there are four different Scott Johnsons between comics and games. 